My name is Emily Wagoner, and I am principal harp with the Spartanburg Philharmonic. And I've done that position. Well, I've played with the orchestra for many years, but I've been principal since 2012. Hi, I'm Keila Walton, and I am relatively new to Spartanburg and very honored to play second harp with the Spartanburg Philharmonic. And I've been here since 2018. So I had, yeah, I had great fun trying to do this virtual duet with you. <laughs> it was fun. Well, uh, and the very first thing I got to do with the Spartanburg Philharmonic was play second harp with you on La Valse. I know, which was awesome because I usually don't get to have a second harp. A lot of the times people ask, well, how come sometimes there's no harp and sometimes there's one harp, sometimes there's two? Yeah, well, of course, the instrument itself uh, has been evolve as it is today for, um, for quite a while. Well, there's so much orchestra lit that doesn't involve the double action pedal harp. In fact, I was just um, prior to this working with uh, a student on the WC Danza Sacré and Profane, uh, and the WC is written for the was originally written for the chromatic harp, mm -hmm. which was you know called, uh, preceded the double action pedal harp, and uh, it was really kind of a flash in the pan because you know after people realized there was a double action pedal harp, then the, nobody wanted to tune as many strings as the chromatic harp. <laughs> right, so if you want to picture a chromatic harp, it actually has two planes of strings that cross. Um, so there's two sets of holes running down the soundboard and the strings cross. It and the double action pedal harp sort of had a, a competition for a while. And for a moment, um, the, the main place where people were trained in this time period was the Paris Conservatory. And uh, for a while, they had a double action pedal harp teacher and they had a chromatic harp teacher. They actually had two different professors. And uh, so as a result, because this WC Dances was written for an, an instrument that had a completely chromatic set of strings, like a piano, uh, when you play it on a modern instrument, it's really challenging. There are hundreds mm -hmm. of pedal changes because WC was exploiting the fact that you could go to any note you wanted, whereas... Mm -hmm. The current, uh, what we mean by double action pedal harp is there's two sets of discs that turn the strings. And so every string has three positions, open, which is flat, and then uh, natural, right, which has the one disc turned, it raises it a half step, and then sharp, when both discs engage the string. And so um, you can't always play every possible combination at once. So for example, if you wanted to have a G sharp in the treble clef, but you wanted to have an uh, you know, a G natural in the bass clef at the same time, you couldn't do that. You'd have to respell it. So you had a G natural pedal and an A flat <laughs> to make exactly. it and harmonically spelled. So, but it's, because that double action harp though, we do have the ability to play all of the notes. And so, and the chromatic harp gave you that ability as well, but it was just a pain in the neck to play. I don't think anybody <laughs> wanted to do it after they realized they could do it with one set of strings. Um, but this is the reason, the chromaticism is the reason why, of course, the other instruments could all play in any key and, and do whatever accidentals they wanted to do. And the harp could not prior to that. So, Right. And so the double action pedal harp was patented in 1810 by a French harp maker, Erard. So then you start to see harp in more orchestral literature after that but it wasn't even as if like bang 1810 hit and then all the conductors or the composers started writing music that involves a harp for the orchestra because they didn't quite know what to do with it to begin with um how did it work what notes could harpists play it was still a little bit of a mystery and probably is today even I think Com composers have a hard time writing for harp because they there are things that are idiomatic for the instrument and then there are things that you know that are, that are very similar to piano but then there are things that are very different from piano and many many composers don't know the difference between those things right so one of the basic things is that everyone has 10 fingers but harpists don't use their pinkies mm -hmm. so we only have four fingers to use on all the strings. And then if you write for piano, your hands look like this. But mm -hmm. if you take that and uh, turn it onto a plane of strings for the harp, it doesn't work. Your right hand has to flip. So basically everything your right hand plays is backwards on if you were to put it on the piano. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, yeah, five finger passages become, which are easy and flawless on keyboard instruments become really challenging on the harp. Very, yeah, yeah, very. You have to do some sort of crazy connection or something. You know that when I first started playing the harp, I think it was at one of my very first lessons, my teacher said something about the pinky finger. And I really don't remember. I was young. I, I was seven when I started. And she, whatever it was, made me think that you would 
that playing with the pinky was something you would learn later <laughs> when you were more advanced. <laughs> I'm sure she didn't say it in meaning that, but she was something right. about it that, uh, that I interpreted to mean that at a later time, I would get to play with my pinky. So after I'd taken maybe six or eight lessons from her, I said, so we'd all gone through how to use all four fingers. And she hadn't said anything about the pinky yet. So I was like, so when are we going to learn how to play with the pinky? <laughs> and she was just like, um, ne- never. Like, like what, what would make you think? That you were going to play with the pinky. And uh, anyway, it was just a, it was hilarious to me because I just assumed coming from piano that we would eventually get to that. But the pinky is really just too short when you're on the strings to really reach the string um, properly if you've got a position that will give you strength with your hand. So it just um, right it doesn't reach. <laughs> when you find a piece with two harps, it's usually you're also going to have four bassoons and, you know, six horns and like a really extended ensemble in all the sections. Um, but really, mostly conductors are saying more harp, more harp, not you need to play softer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Getting shushed is the ultimate compliment for a harp. Yes, right. Okay. <laughs> Less harp, it's too much. Yes, yes. Yes. It's really the other way around for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's really nice when you'll have a conductor who you'll have a piece on the program that calls for two harps, but he'll let you double everything just for yes, volume. Cause yes. Or even program more than one piece that has two harps. Although mm-hmm. I know that, that there's a lot more to programming a, a program than, you know, what your instrumentation is. So. Right. I mean, if I was programming stuff all the time, everything <laughs> would be like 1830 and later. <laughs> It'd be Wagner pieces that needed 20 harps. Right, right. <laughs> Magic fire music. Yeah, yeah. Wagner was always so overkill about everything, but um, we always appreciated the fact that how enthusiastic he was about harp. So. Right, yeah. So um, Wagner in his ring cycle, the instrumentation is for six harps. Um, and most of the time, those are three harps playing one part and three harps playing a different part. And so you're just doing it for volume. But occasionally, right. it's actually two, two, and two. Uh, so it's actually written for three distinct harp parts. And but then he also wrote for just a really enormous orchestra. Loud, he would just need that many harps to keep up with his right. enormous orchestra. <laughs> yeah, for volume, exactly. Yeah. And we're going to, we're going to be playing some cadenzas, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So tell so, us about your Britain. <laughs> well, so, um, you know, I was thinking, we were thinking, well, what could we play? What could we do? And we thought, oh, well, you know, Jupiter. And there's this great two harp arrangement of that. And then I was like, okay, well, what would go with Jupiter written by Holst? Okay. Who else? And I was thinking, what about English composers and, and things that show off the harp? And I was like, oh, Benjamin Britten, who was British. What an easy way to remember that. Um, and he wrote a piece called The Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra. And he wrote it in, I believe, 1945. Mm-hmm. And it was originally written, uh, commissioned as part of a, a BBC documentary. And the whole point was it was going to be this showcase to teach people about the different instruments, the different sections, how the orchestra is organized, the different colors it creates. And so every instrument in the orchestra gets um, a variation, he called it. Um, but so it's sort of like a cadenza and that there is this harp moment where it's mostly harp playing by itself, but unlike um, an actual cadenza, it's conducted. So you have to go the tempo that the conductor is giving you. <laughs> because a lot you- of times with a cadenza, the conductor just kind of, okay, I'm gonna back <laughs> off, I'll let you do your thing. And then I'm going to come back in. So, but right. not the case with Britain. Right, right. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. In most cadenzas, the conductor just puts down their hands and lets this solo instrument do its thing. Um, but all throughout the Britain, all the variations are conducted, even though people have these big solo moments. <laughs> And then I'll be playing the Tchaikovsky um, Nutcracker Suite. Uh, and the, the cadenza for this 
um, in the Waltz of the Flowers is probably, wouldn't you agree, uh, Keila, the, the most played cadenza ever for harp? Yes, yes. I mean, it's always going to be on any kind of orchestral audition. Oh, yeah. Um, and the, the Nutcracker Suite for orchestra is, you know, very popular. It's, it's, play, it's I mean, if you, you would have to work hard to not be able to go hear it no. <laughs> with an orchestra somewhere <laughs> in December. Yeah. And Tchaikovsky wrote a number of awesome pieces for orchestra and for ballet, and including the mm. great heart parts. But I, I think that the Nutcracker is still his top seller today in the fact that the Nutcracker Suite is so frequently performed. So it's, it's just a standard. And, you know, you would never would have thought given the history of the Tchaikovsky Nutcracker Ballet when it was premiered in Russia, you know, in um, the late 1800s, 1890s, I'm pretty sure uh, it was not deemed a success. Mm -hmm. It was, first of all, how to set yourself up to not succeed. It was a double premiere with an opera. So by the time you got to the end of the second act of the Nutcracker, it's like midnight. <laughs> you know? uh, a lot of winner. <laughs> right. Uh, so it wasn't really a big hit. And uh, it didn't, you know, now we think of the Nutcracker Ballet as it, it's ubiquitous. It's, it's part of December. It's a tradition. It's a tra certainly here in Spartanburg. They always mm -hmm. do the Nutcracker every year. And mm -hmm. uh, many ballet companies, it's almost half their income stream is the Nutcracker mm -hmm. performances. They'll do so many. When I lived in Austin, the Ballet Austin did over 20 performances of the Nutcracker in December. And it's not in San Francisco, which was the first ballet company in America to do the Nutcracker in the 40s. Oh, um, hmm. They they do, I mean, over 60 performances of the Nutcracker, <laughs> you know, I mean, so it's just, you know, two shows a day for all of December. <laughs> you know? You're playing it in your sleep after that. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> which is what makes playing the entire ballet such a challenge, because the first time you come in to play the Nutcracker with an orchestra the odds are everyone else in that pit with you has played this 30 to 3000 times yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. and it's yeah. your first time and it's just daunting and terrifying yeah. you know it's and it's often the first cadenza i teach students mm -hmm. um, because it's is one that's manageable for students and yet it's also one that's often required even right and the other cadenzas, Sleeping Beauty, Swan Lake, mm -hmm. um, they they share a lot in common with the Nutcracker cadenza. So it's very yes. easy to, once you've mastered a lot of the skills in the Nutcracker cadenza, you have yes. them for the other Tchaikovsky cadenzas. So, yes. And I mean, everyone loves it. I, I even, yeah. I, I never get sick of the Nutcracker. Just, I, the cadenza, the ballet, I, I mean, I love, I love using it as a warm up. Honestly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and uh, so most of the time, starting around in October, I'll start using the Nutcracker cadenza <laughs> as part of my warm up, and then in like January or February, I'm like, I really should warm up on something else. <laughs> <laughs> Would like to thank everyone who has come to concerts, who has donated to the orchestra, who is absolutely supporting us in this truly unprecedented time in our lives. Um, and yeah, it's it's challenging and, and weird, and I know I miss performing, and um, so it was nice to have a recording project. That yes. So. so it's very different um, to do it in your own house and not to be with everyone else because I think it's the togetherness of the orchestra being on the stage together that makes it so special and playing for a live audience. So I hope that will be in our future soon. Well, it's a real pleasure to talk with you, Keila. Thank you for taking the time to be yes. here today. Yes, it's been a fun conversation as always. It's always fun to talk harp geek stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.